Welcome back to another video for AP Psychology. This is lesson number nine on the central nervous system, also known as the brain. And so uh, this lesson is going to focus on breaking down these structures within the brain and what are their functions and uh, overall looking at how these areas are related, looking at the plasticity of the brain and uh, ultimately just kind of some general tips on how to remember some of these structures. So uh, first we have the brain stem, which you can see here. And although this is not a brain stem in itself, this is a picture of cauliflower, which oftentimes people have linked to resembling what a brain looks like. And so uh, the brain stem is actually going to be your innermost region of the brain. And uh, it's pretty much the oldest part of you. And it is going to be home to most of your vital function. And so if you were suffering from some type of head trauma or some type of brain damage, if this area uh, remained unscathed, then you would basically most likely still be able to survive in a uh, vegetable-like state. So you would still be breathing, you would still have a heartbeat, um, and those are going to be really two of the main functions dictated by the brainstem. Uh, your brainstem is going to be divided into two parts and those parts are the, the medulla and the pons and uh, the three parts that are up here, the medulla, the pons, and the cerebellum actually make up a structure of the brain also known as uh, the hind brain uh, but we'll start with the medulla so the medulla is basically the base of your brainstem this is what's going to attach to the spinal cord and the function of the medulla is to mostly control unconscious function uh, the biggest one being basically breathing so uh, making sure that your lungs are uh, pushing oxygen and also your uh, heartbeat so making sure that there is a circulation of blood flow there are also some other functions you can see on there that the uh, medulla also controls some reflexive behaviors like sneezing and coughing uh, above the medulla is then the pons the second part of the brainstem and the pons is known as the bridge. It is uh, bridging fibers that will connect both the brain stem, the lower brain stem being the medulla, and then also the cerebellum, which is not part of the brain stem, but it is part of the hind brain. And so uh, the pons has been linked with movement as well as breathing, sleep, and arousal. Um, the cerebellum is also known as the tiny brain or the little brain and this is going to be connected to the brainstem thanks to the pons and so this is going to be a part of the brain responsible for coordinating fine muscle movements and balance the cerebellum is the first part of your brain that actually experiences the effects of alcohol and so since it is regulating fine muscle movement this is why there are a number of specific tests that would occur if you were pulled over for a suspicion of driving under the influence, which I know is not going to happen to any of my viewers, but uh, doing tests that require fine muscle movement like balancing, uh, walking across the white line and staying on the line, reaching your arm out all the way out uh, as far as it can extend and then slowly bringing just one finger back to your nose. These are things that are fine motor movements. And so the cerebellum being the first one depressed by alcohol is going to cause you uh, a lack of control of those functions. Uh, here is a picture of what a, a cutout fashion of the hind brain looks like. And so you can see at the bottom you basically have your spinal cord connecting with the medulla and then the pons above that and then the cerebellum um, at, towards the mid back end of the brainstem. Now keep in mind the cerebellum is not part of the brainstem. It is just part of the hind brain. Uh, here again is another picture of the human brain from the sideways perspective. And there's a whole bunch of other things on here that will be covered in this video. But again, just looking at the bottom, you can see down here where the mouse cursor is, you have the medulla, you have the pons, and then you have the cerebellum attached to that and kind of behind that. And so uh, the medulla, this is the same medulla oblongata that uh, people are sometimes familiar with from Adam Sandler's famous line in, I believe it was, The Waterboy. So it's the same thing, medulla oblongata or medulla. 
The next area of your brain is referred to as the midbrain, and the function of the midbrain is to integrate sensory processes. So the midbrain will also contain dopamine releasing neurons, so it's kind of considered an area where we have the dopamine, the reward neurotransmitter. The function of the reticular formation deals primarily with sleep and arousal, and so it's going to actually carry stimulation to wake you up if you need to. Uh, it also contributes to this perception of pain, breathing, and muscle reflexes. So by now what you're probably noticing is that some of these areas of the brain have some crossover with other ones, but the main function for the reticular formation will be dealing with sleep and arousal. Um, and then we have the forebrain, and the forebrain is the largest, most complex part of the brain. And the forebrain has a whole lot of components. Um, you've got the thalamus, you've got the hypothalamus, the limbic system, and the cerebrum. So the cerebrum is your brain center for complex thought. And outside of the cerebrum, you have the cerebral cortex, which is the wrinkly surface of the cerebrum. It's the outer layer of the brain. It's the uh, in pictures, it's the pink folded layers. So the purpose of the cerebral cortex having all of these wrinkly folded layers is uh, it is actually allowing you to basically squash more surface area of brain uh, in the space that is allowed. So uh, your brain is not having a lot of space there in your head. And so by having these folded layers, you're actually being able to cram more of uh, brain tissue into your head. So first we've got the thalamus. Thalamus is the area of your brain responsible for the relay of sensory information. And so any type of sensory information, if it's sight, if it's sound, if it is taste, if it's touch, any of those senses are going to be routed through the thalamus and then they'll be uh, directed to whichever area of the brain they need to go. The only exception for sensory information that is not routed to the thalamus is going to be smell. Smell is actually going to be handled in a separate part of brain tissue known as the olfactory bulb, and this is going to uh, be covered in a later video. Next we have the hypothalamus, which is your regulator of biological needs. Hypo literally meaning just below, so just below the thalamus is your hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is going to control your autonomic nervous system. This is the same part of your nervous system that will control more uh, involuntary functions, uh, eventually possibly leading to the fight or flight response. The hypothalamus is also your brain's link with the endocrine system. And so the hypothalamus will release a hormone that will then direct your body's endocrine system, particularly the master gland, the pituitary gland, to release a hormone or communicate with other glands in the body to uh, release the needed hormone. Uh, generally, people are referring to the functions of the hypothalamus as the four Fs. And so those things are going to be uh, fighting and fleeing as part of the fight or flight response. So you have fighting, you have fleeing, you have feeding, and then generally they'll say um, mating or sex, or you could say fornication. That is a, a fourth F. But there is actually a fifth F as well, and that would be Fahrenheit. So um, the hypothalamus also is going to be responsible for regulating body temperature. And so really you could change it to the five Fs if you were trying to be clever to remember it. But again, hypothalamus, regulator of biological needs. If this is not functioning, you're not going to be alive very long. The next area of the brain is the limbic system. And uh, so if we're coming from a regulator of biological needs, now we are looking at emotional regulation. And so the limbic system is the center of emotion and it is the brain's major pleasure cortex. And the limbic system is really referred to as a general area, but it is including a few different components. So the hypothalamus actually is part of this, as is the hippocampus and the amygdala, and then the olfactory bulb. So within the limbic system, there are some areas identified as contributing certain emotions or uh, having a certain skill. So we have the hippocampus, which is heavily involved in learning and memory processes. And uh, there is actually a region within this known as the hippocampal medial temporal lobe. And this is the area, including the hippocampus and the area around the hippocampus that is all believed to contribute to uh, both learning and memory. And then a specific area of the limbic system that we are certain 
is uh, focused on one particular emotion in general is going to be the amygdala and this area of the brain is going to focus on both fear and aggression and so uh, there's a case of something we'll look at in class basically there was a uh, unfortunate incident there's a, a shooter at a university and uh, this guy ended up actually having a tumor about the size of a walnut I believe and this tumor was pressing right up against his amygdala and so uh, after the fact he ended up being killed by uh, the police response but um, to kind of give the family some solace they did an autopsy and found that he had this tumor and the tumor was pressing up against his amygdala so it was believed well maybe um, that could have been actually causing this guy to have increased fear or rage or aggression and that's maybe what perpetuated his violent act. Now, Obviously it can't be proven but uh, we are certain that the amygdala is responsible for fear and aggression. And then we get to uh, the cerebrum again the center of complex thought so the cerebrum is where you are really thinking it is where you are also learning it has emotions it has your consciousness and it has voluntary movement so uh, at this point your brain is going to be divided up into two different hemispheres we'll call them the cerebral hemispheres and this is where your brain is going to start showing some dominance between the left and right half and so what this means is that your brain has lateralization. Lateralization implying that one part of your brain is excelling or dominant in one task where the other half of the brain is going to be dominant in another task. And so uh, there's this chart here which you can pause and see but uh, just to kind of uh, highlight some of these things it would be like saying the left half of your brain is more dominant for uh, logical thinking whereas the right half of your brain is more dominant for visual spatial analysis uh, emotional awareness so there's a bunch of these other things we're going to focus on probably in the next video but uh, I'll try to reference it again these two halves of your brain are going to be connected by something known as the corpus callosum and the corpus callosum is basically a structure that will connect the two brain hemispheres um, overall uh, the corpus callosum has communication for uh, visual pathways, it has for muscle movement. Many, many of your brain's connecting points are going to pass through the corpus callosum. So this is that structure that is needed to connect both the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere. And we'll actually see later uh, in the next video how people are affected when their corpus callosum is severed. Of course, you may be wondering why would someone sever that. So uh, you'll just have to tune into the next video and see why the corpus callosum may be severed to help improve someone's life. But your uh, brain hemispheres are going to be divided up into four lobes or four regions. And uh, these look like the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, the temporal lobe, and then the frontal lobe. And so each one of these areas has a specific function that is kind of uh, in tune with. So the occipital lobe is in the back of your head and it is the primary visual cortex. One of the ways to think about where the occipital lobe would be is if you were hit in the back of the head with a baseball bat you would maybe think I'm seeing stars so you're seeing stars you're getting hit back here in the back of the head if you want to think about uh, also what is the function of the occipital lobe just put a tiny dot in the O of occipital and you've turned it into an eyeball and maybe that will help you think about vision. For the parietal lobe this is uh, in the front of the occipital lobe and it is also known as the somatosensory lobe or the somatosensory cortex. What's that, uh, what is that meaning? It is about feeling tactile sensation or basically touch. Uh, one of the ways to think about where this may be, um, I, I saw something one time talking about uh, your grandparents wanting to or, or anyone really it doesn't have to be your grandparents, but someone basically putting their head, uh, their hand on your head, and patting you kind of in the back and saying good job. That area where they're most likely patting you is the parietal lobe. So that's maybe one way to think about it. Next, you have the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is just below the parietal lobe, basically located on the sides where your ears are. So this is the primary auditory cortex. The temporal lobe is dealing with sound, and then you have the frontal lobe which is basically behind your forehead 
I'm sorry if my nose is itching. I got like a hair on my face. Um, so the frontal lobe is basically right behind your forehead and it deals with primary motor cortex, uh, so motor movement skills. It's the largest lobe. It also deals with uh, working memory, the prefrontal cortex, some decision making, some judgments. Um, it's very complex. So that basically is your four lobes. All right, so the final point I want to go over real quickly before this video comes to an end is looking at plasticity of the brain and what does that actually mean. So brain plasticity basically is going to discuss how your brain can adapt, how malleable it is, how it can change based on situation. Uh, your brain can actually have parts of your brain shaped by experience. So it's been found in people who are musicians, people who play the piano, their auditory cortex, their temporal lobe has actually grown based off of their experience, being more receptive to the sounds of pianos, being more receptive to the sounds of different instruments that they're playing. Their, this part of the brain is basically getting larger and it is from all of the learning that is occurring, it's allowing it to actually be more receptive to uh, enhancing that skill. Brain damage can also lead to natural reorganization. Now, there are some types of brain damage that are not going to heal. Um, for example, within your central nervous system, we're talking about the brain and the spinal cord. So if your spinal cord is pretty much severed completely, that is probably not going to heal. That person would most likely be paralyzed for the rest of their life. Um, you know, obviously, you can't say that without a complete uh, doubt. I mean, uh, there are miracles that happen, and, you know, just the human body is uh, very, very strong. But typically, where some uh, neurons can regenerate, some cells can regenerate. The spinal cord is not something that is normally going to completely regenerate if it is severed. Uh, but what can happen is your brain can have reorganization. So, for example, if you had a finger that got chopped off and uh, you lost sensation in that finger, you're not going to be able to touch anything if you lose the tip of that finger. You're not going to be able to touch and necessarily feel. Uh, your other fingers can actually become more receptive to a tactile stimulation to compensate for the lost finger. If someone is uh, blind or deaf, the auditory cortex, the temporal lobe or the occipital lobe can have uh, more sensitivity, it can be more receptive to uh, doing things like reading braille or having increased peripheral vision. So there's a lot of reorganization that can occur within the brain. And then lastly is looking at the topic of regeneration. So when neurons in the brain do regenerate, this is known as a process called neurogenesis. And basically it is just saying that, look, neurons can regenerate. You know, I said earlier, the spinal cord is probably not going to completely heal if it's severed, but neurons can regenerate. So uh, that is a possibility. Well, that's pretty much going to conclude this video on the brain and uh, the functions of the brain. So I hope that there has been some valuable information gained as a result of you watching this video. And as always, I hope to see you next time. Thanks.